Welcome to tonight's AO Trauma Hand North America Online Three Case Fireside Series. Tonight's topic is upper extremity flaps. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Marco Rizzo from the Mayo Clinic, who's our chairperson for the Hand Education Committee for putting this uh, event together, as well as leading our educational uh, efforts. Uh, I'm the moderator tonight, Dr. Jay Bridgman from St. Louis University. Our stage this evening is Dr. Paul Binhammer from the University of Toronto. And I'm pleased to have uh, Dr. Sonu Jain from The Ohio State University, uh, as well mm -hmm. as our uh, therapy colleague, Keely Elwood from the Mayo Clinic. So I want to say thank you for all of our, our faculty. These are our financial disclosures. And uh, this is our agenda tonight. I'm trying to stay on time. And then for our CME credit, we'd like you to know that you can get CME credit for our uh, event tonight, but it's at the conclusion of the entire series, which is in December. But the uh, link will be sent to you and you can uh, obtain credit and receive a certificate for the CME. Just a part of our uh, who we are is uh, we're a nonprofit surgical specialty society uh, dedicated to teaching. We don't endorse or promote any uh, specific product or service of a commercial entity. But anything we discuss, including equipment, is really for demonstration and teaching purposes to enhance the learning experience. All of the microphones have been muted and video cameras turned off for uh, our Zoom session this evening. But we'd like you to be involved through the question and answer box. Uh, we'd like to have the audience uh, ask questions so we can go through those as well during this evening. These are our learning objectives for the series itself. And uh, just to update you where we are, this is our third uh, session. Next month, April, will be uh, Sage Chuck Cassidy will be speaking on biceps tendon rupture. We do have, if you notice, we have a break in the summer, uh, starting again in September and then finishing in December with DRUJ arthritis. A lot of our uh, educational content that we provide on a yearly basis, though, are in-person courses. So if you've never been to one of our in-person courses, uh, for example, we're talking about flaps tonight, if there's certain flaps you'd like to get more hands-on experience, uh, please take advantage of our in-person course um, courses throughout the year, including single-day courses over a weekend or the Advanced Upper Extremity Cadaver course, which is uh, this year in Las Vegas, co-chaired by Peter Ree and Kevin Malone. We have the uh, Advanced Risk Summit this year, uh, co-chaired by Dr. Marco Rizzo and Kim Mezra. So please uh, keep up to date for the website so you can register. Some additional webinars that are outside the series that we'll be covering Tonight, we're just doing regional and local flaps, but we're going to be covering on May 3rd, uh, specifically free flaps, uh, how to incorporate free flap uh, transfers in your practice. And then um, Mangled Hand by Neil uh, Bott in August, as well as the Terrible Triad by Jeff Lawton from the University of Michigan in November. All of our content is recorded and is available on YouTube through our AO Hand North America channel. We also want to uh, let you know that a lot of our content is live stream, including all of the AO uh, uh, trauma educational activities are live streamed through Ortho TV. So we want to say thank you to Ortho TV, our uh, collaborator. So tonight, we're really building on uh, two uh, uh, thorough webinars that have been done in the past. We usually do a yearly webinar on soft tissue reconstruction and flaps. So both the I refer you to the 2021 webinar and 2022 webinar. They're more didactic and very thorough in the coverage of pretty much every flap that's been described for soft tissue reconstruction in the hand and upper extremity from fingertip injuries, VY advancement, Moberg, to even free flaps. Uh, tonight, we're going to build on that foundation. And we're going to talk about how to develop, uh, not just what to do, but how to do it, how to incorporate a treatment plan into a successful outcome for your patient. Uh, we're going to go over recognizing, anticipating, managing complications, and then coordinating collaborative post-operative therapy regimen with our therapy colleagues. So Dr. Uh, Amit Gupta, who's uh, one of our leaders in soft tissue uh, reconstruction for our group, uh, he, he succinctly described this in those two videos. The goals of our treatment for the soft tissue reconstruction is to restore function. We're doing that through restoring mobility, sensibility, cosmesis, um, uh, avoiding donor side morbidity, and remembering that it has to be durable. The best possible function, uh, it should be balanced with the least morbidity and the best cosmesis. Another way to think about this, he describes, is just making a needs list, a needs assessment. Is this something that needs to cover exposed implants? Or maybe there's an exposed uh, joint or articular uh, surfaces that are not covered. 
Um, typically, there's some type of loss from trauma. So tendon segmental defects, nerve defects, uh, bone loss that needs reconstruction. All of these things we're incorporating in our needs list to come up with a surgical plan, but remembering uh, that it should allow gliding and early range of motion, so, so something that will not be adherent. When we think about just making preoperative plans, uh, if you're new to AO, this is a concept in, uh, that's very heavily stressed uh, in, in, the, uh, in the AO concept of uh, addressing surgical problems. So essentially, the four uh, components would be your surgical plan, like what surgery do you think the patient needs, followed by your technical plan or the sequence, how you're going to uh, practically achieve this surgical plan through sequence of steps. And then finally, it's your uh, coming up with an equipment list and uh, a, a plan for making sure that you have all of the things you need to, to do the surgery. And then the communication, a lot of the errors and a lot of the things that, that occur could be avoided with a better communication, whether that's through your own surgical team or, or um, errors with uh, miscommunication with your, your colleagues in therapy or with the family. We're trying to reduce morbidity and reduce mortality, but uh, although in this setting, it's like flap failure, like mortality of the flap or digit loss or, or, or uh, amputation. So to go over this uh, quickly, a case of mine, this is a 17-year-old female who was ejected from a motor vehicle accident and landed in a field. It was highly contaminated wound with um, the extensor tendons uh, were lacerated. Um, this was initially hours of debridement uh, you can see that in this lower uh, picture that the, the wound is much larger than what we started with because she had grass and dirt impacted underneath the skin flap. So um, needed better exposure. But in my needs assessment, you know, what's the type of wound? It's a large wound. It's traumatic. There's uh, tendons that are disrupted that are need to be repaired. But I'm already worried about uh, what type of adhesions would occur uh, with whatever reconstruction she would need. There's skin that's missing. The zone of injury is fairly large, like the entire dorsal hand. So I'm thinking of their local perforators that might help me. I didn't think so. Um, this is a uh, an acute wound. Uh, and then sometimes you're inheriting something from another person. Maybe it's a chronic wound. It's already been operated several times. And there's other incisions that you may have to manage. In this setting, they were my own incisions. But you want to provide a reconstructive plan that allows early range of motion and gliding. When we think about a surgical uh plan with the reconstructive ladder is a concept that's helpful for learners because it gives you an idea of what's possible. Uh, the downside of the ladder would be sometimes it leads to lower complexity choices that if they fail, then we would go on and do something that's more complicated. But in that time period, uh, the outcome for the patient may not be as good. Like you may, you may be able to get a flap to heal, but you've lost that early period where the therapy couldn't be done because they are having wound problems. So I think the reconstructive elevator is another concept that's been described that it's really you're trying to balance what's the best surgery for the patient with, in the context of their uh, injury. And you can think of balancing form, function, and safety or what some have described as the reconstructive triangle. So in this setting, you know, she's, not infected, but she, she had a contaminated wound that's now clean. Uh, for weight bearing and range of motion, we're looking for early range of motion. We don't want to uh, have to delay getting therapy started. And so we need something that's going to uh, give us that. Um, the regional vessels are intact and healthy. And then, of course, she's healthy with no other comorbidities or social factors. And so my surgical plan, the choice was a reverse rate of foreign flap. Although for the dorsal hand, I chose a fascia only reconstruction that would be skin grafted. Now, the benefits of it is that it's reliable, it's durable, it restores like tissue, it's a thin dorsal reconstruction, allows early range of motion. There was no, I did not uh, delay any of the therapy, we started right away. Um, and then in this setting, this was at a regional hospital that I covered call, uh, so I didn't even live in this, in this town. Uh, but for the timing, uh, there wasn't another surgeon available at that hospital who could do the reconstruction. So this is something I could do with Without a microscope, it's something that can be done very simply in that uh, OR setting, and they had all the equipment. The postoperative care would be very uh, routine for the staff that would be taking care of her until I returned uh, 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 for another visit. The downside is it's a major vessel that has to be sacrificed, so the radial artery has to be uh, used. And then as far as donor side morbidity, we tend to think of that with radial flaps, although in this setting, it was just a longitudinal incision. There was no skin paddle. 
So I'm, I won't go through all the details of the surgical plan, but this would be the next step is how am I going to achieve that reconstruction? You can see I've, I've marked out the perforators along the uh, radial artery where I'm going to make my incision. Um, we, you know, measuring the defect as well as, you know, significant length and allowing a, a, a gentle rotation versus uh, being under tension or an acute bend in the pedicle. Um, and then finally, uh, the skin grafting. As far as the equipment, the, again, there's not a lot of uh, complex equipment, but things like uh, Doppler probe, the, the different types of suture material that I might need. And then lastly, I've never done a reconstruction in this hospital. So do they have the dermatome that I would use or do they have a mesher or carrier? Uh, lastly, I would say, you know, this patient doesn't have an external fixer, but sometimes you're working in combination with another team. And if they have an external fixator, can that be loosened? Do I have the equipment to loosen that? Do they need to come back to help, you know, you know, uh, realign the external fixer the way that they want it? So I'm thinking about all those issues um, uh, for the equipment. And then lastly, this is the last step. It's just uh, going through the communication. This is her at 10 weeks. You can see that um, this has gone on to heal well. Even the wound has, has uh, uh, contracted some with the skin graft. But the key is her range of motion. We were able to start early range of motion with the therapist. We had a very a close collaborative plan with therapy at that hospital. Um, but you want to remember the communication is key with your own team, with the OR team, uh, with the family, the expectations, uh, what's, what, what, what will be, uh, you know, the surgery as well as the post doctor plan, and then finally the therapy. Now I'm going to stop sharing here because uh, Dr. Benhammer is going to segue into cases. I don't see uh, Dr. Benhammer. Chris, can you respond? It looks like he's not on. I'll try to uh, contact him. It says he has it. I just got a text saying he had an internet failure. Well, why don't we do this? Uh, his is case based. So why don't we go to Dr. Jane and we'll just talk about complications. Although it's not in the order that we planned, I'd rather do that than, than wait uh, uh, to try to address his um, internet failure. But Dr. Jane, uh, kind of orient us to like how to be prepared, what you're thinking about, you know, as you embark on a complicated reconstruction, how to avoid, anticipate, and treat complications. Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks, Jay. I'll let me pull up my talk here. And... Okay. Be able to see that okay? Yeah, it looks good. Perfect. Okay. Well, well, thank you for having me. So I'm going to talk about flaps, complication, and other options. So we had a wonderful introduction about, about flaps, and, and I'm not going to go over um, the um, how to do these. These are covered in the previous uh, AO webinars that were done, but I want to allude to the reconstructive ladder that was mentioned earlier. And so basically... Um, you want to think of actually more of a hybrid uh, orthoplastic reconstructive ladder, which utilizes uh, regenerative medicine therapy. So you want to utilize newer techniques as well where needed, such as muscle-derived uh, stem cells, adipose-derived stem cells, uh, dermal regenerative templates, external tissue expanders, uh, porcine urinary bladder extracellular matrices and nerve conduits. These are options to consider as well. Um, and don't be afraid to go up and down the ladder as you need to, because um, your, your surgeries, your potential complications may dictate that. So how not to have complications? Well, first of all, you want to try to avoid complications before you, you know, you want to be able to recognize them. So um, can the patient tolerate the procedure that is planned? Um, do they have comorbidities that preclude them from having the, the big surgery that you have planned for them in mind. Maybe something 
is, uh, you know, less is more in, in some scenarios. But uh, again, you want to do what's best for your patient. Um, look at the donor and recipient sites. Is, is, it, is the donor site appropriate for uh, what you're planning on, on taking for the recipient uh, and vice versa? You want to look at all that. Look at the donor defect. Um, is this donor defect tolerable? Um, and you want to make sure your primary wound is adequately debrided. You don't want to have a, an, an inappropriately debrided wound that may uh, cause flap failure or an, any other kind of reconstructive option failure as well. Um, and then you also want to make sure your recipient vessel is out of the zone of injury. You want to pay particular attention to this in, in crush injuries. <laughs> and um, you also want to make sure you have a meticulous but efficient flap dissection. You don't want to take too long uh, in doing that because that has uh, other sequelae of problems of of desiccation and and and, and stasis of of, of uh, you know blood flow and, and the flaps and, and whatnot. So you want to make sure that you you are uh, meticulous, but 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 being uh, you know efficient with that. And then use a vascular grafting if necessary. There's some data that suggested that. Um, you know, putting um, venous gra um, grafts and um, may cause complications, but other data has shown that it really has not done so. So if you need to utilize vascular grafting, feel free to do so. Um, so now we go to complications. So the, the early complications are typically seen in the first 24 hours. So if you have a sudden loss of perfusion, you want to Think about ischemia time, you know, especially in muscle flaps. You want to try to keep that below three hours. Um, you worry about, uh, you know, a reperfusion uh, you know, injury. Um, you also want to think about the vessel anastomosis. Kinking is, is your, is your pedicle uh, twisted. Um, and once you consider these things and, and they don't look like they're the problem, then think about vessel spasm. Talk to your anesthesiologist. So is the patient, you know, getting vasopressors? Um, or how's their blood pressure? And then also look at the actual anastomosis itself. Is there, is there a thrombus? at either the arterial venous end. And then pay attention to the pressure. You could have a tight inset, which may be causing that pressure, or you could have a hematoma. And then we also have the late complications. So these typically don't involve the flap itself, and it's very uncommon after 72 hours. They tend to be more systemic complications, such as things as DVT, pneumonia, fluid overload, and or infection. So you want to keep in mind of those as, as later um, problems. So um, these complications I'm going to present to you um, could be applied. To, these are Some of these are, are free tissue transfer cases, but this is very well applicable to a pedicled flap. So I think you want to not really pay attention to the fact that this is a free tissue transfer versus a pedicle transfer, but you know a lot of complications are similar. So this is one of my partners, Dr. Ryan Schmucker. So this is a sarcoma defect. He had a lateral arm flap reconstruction. And as you can see here, this is drawn out. Looks, looks quite beautiful. But the problem encountered here is not so much the flap, it's just that the donor site uh, couldn't close it. And this may not be a true complication, but you know, in, in somebody's mind, it could be because usually we can we can tend to close these. So maybe the pet, maybe the skin paddle is too big. So in this case, the um, patient was uh, temporized with a vac uh, negative pressure dressing, and that's not necessary if you don't have that. You can put put a um, uh, standard nonstick dressing. But this was addressed with a external tissue expander. So if you go back to that hybrid reconstructive ladder, this is one of those. Uh, this is one of those rungs on that ladder, right? And so you utilize this for the defect. And after about three days of this, this was able to be primarily closed without a problem. So you can use that reconstructive uh, ladder, um, not only for your flap, but also for your flap defect. So um, complication number two was an electrical burn. You can see a pretty, pretty injured thumb. And this was reconstructed with a pedicle groin flap. And you can see after debridement, um, wonderful um, flap placement. And here, the, the complication is uh, dehiscence of the flap. And this is worrisome because we're impeding the blood supply that's coming off the recipient site, which will be needed once the division inset occurs. And so this was addressed by going uh, suturing this back in place twice in the OR to try to get this back. In, and, and eventually, this was able to be divided uh, and this survived. But I think uh, you have to uh, sort of address this by really having a conversation with the patient for something like this. Also, 
doing whatever you can to help stabilize this arm, whether suture sometimes can't help in this case. Sometimes you may have to almost kind of uh, wrap their, their arm to their side and, and, and put some, uh, you know, um, other uh, materials, bandages around the, the, maybe the wrist to hold in place. Some people have, you know, put Steinman pins, but I'm not advocating that. But, um, but I think you have to, you have to be careful with this. Um, and the other thing is, if you're not sure that you have adequate perfusion of the flap from your recipient site, you can, um, you can sort of uh, tie off the, uh, the, uh, 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 axial pedicle to this and, and compress it, uh, gently and, and, and see if the blood supply is still holding up from the, from the recipient side. And if that's so, then you can probably proceed to divide this. So the uh, third complication is another sarcoma defect, which was construct, reconstructed with an osteocutaneous free fibula flap. And as you can see here, this is the flap harvest. And, and you can see on the right side the complication here. So the complication here is is hematoma. Um, it's pretty self-explanatory. And so this is this was taken back to the OR and, and evacuated. But uh, and this is caught in time to to save the flap overall. However, there was an injury to the skin paddle, and there was some necrosis to this, and required subsequent debridement a couple of times in the OR. And the the bulk of the flap uh, deep to the to the skin paddle was was intact and perfused. But the skin paddle was eventually debrided off, and uh, the volume was there to cover the dorsal and the hand. And the swelling after it went down was able to be close, uh, was allowed the hand to be closed primarily. So, um, again, going back to the you know reconstructive ladder again, you, you go higher, but you can also go back down on the ladder for you know a secondary uh, closure of that. So this brings me to alternatives. So you can use skin substitutes, and so there's the dermal regenerative templates. And the one typically used is a bilayer of temporary uh, silicone epidermis and collagen chondroitin silk sulfate dermis. So it's a, you know, a combination of both. And uh, this was initially developed for the treatment of burns. And it's really, it works well for uh, wounds that aren't really suitable for direct skin graft, graft coverage immediately, especially with exposed tendons or bone. And, and you can use this as a temporary uh, uh, measure to manage the wound before you do your final reconstruction, or you can use this to actually be your, your definitive mode of reconstruction with creating a base for skin grafting. So the advantages of this are, you know, you minimize the donor site morbidity, you can provide a reasonable outcome, which is uh, can be aesthetically and 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 functionally uh, um, satisfying. Um, the skin graft can potentially be of better quality, um, thickness, and pliability. And uh, there's some data to show that you can have some gradual regeneration of, of nerve endings. Now, the disadvantage is cost. This is not cheap. It, it, it is costly. So, um, and you can have similar failures to. Uh, the skin graft uh, or the actual dermal matrix itself with an infection, hematoma, and, and or graft failure. And you want to make sure you stabilize it just like you do for any other skin graft as well. But you don't have any growth of adnexal ad structures in, in a split thickness skin graft placement. So it's a case of mine who, uh, gentleman who had uh, squamosal carcinoma of the dorsum of the hand, he underwent nose micrographic surgery for excision. Margins are clean. Um, obviously, you know that's important to know. And then uh, we placed this and uh, left this on for about two weeks. Um, it created a nice base for uh, split thickness skin grafting. I typically um, don't mesh these unless they're uh, unless it's an area that is hard to really contour. I do create some little pie crust holes to allow the fluid to sort of egress, so that's not you know less likely to have hematoma. And I definitely put a very firm. Um, uh, bolster on this, just like I do for any other skin graft. And the patient one month after split the skin graft, I did quite well, I had very good healing, um, just some skin crusting here, but otherwise everything was covered and he was able to extend well. And obviously with some immobilization and, and his age, he was a little stiff and with therapy, he was able to make a full fist, but he was able to get gliding uh, of the tendons beneath the, uh, the skin graft from this. So the message you want to take home from this is complications can be minimized by proper indications. You want to plan carefully and try to be efficient with your surgery. And you want to have close monitoring for rapid intervention. Um, and uh, you know, you also want to consider all reasonable options in the reconstructive ladder, including the alternatives. Thank you, Dr. Jane. Thanks. Uh, while Dr. Uh, ben Hammer is uh, pulling up his slides, I just had a question for you. When uh, do you think for regenerative templates, um, they need to have some amount of soft tissue around the tendons. Like if, 
So for example, the Mohs case, you know, you can see the tendons, but there's also some muscle and fascia there that seems pretty well vascularized. Like when do you draw the line where you'd say, probably not so great. I've had some regenerative template cases where I had to go back a second time. Like we got some incorporation, but then at the time I'd like to do skin grafting. There still were some tendons that uh, maybe 50% of them now have granulated tissue. The others don't. So I did a second round. What, what are your thoughts on, you know, how to know when I probably should stay away from the regenerative template versus uh, going forward? Are there some principles there that can guide the patient? Yeah, I think if there's, you know, if it's if it's purely muscle, I don't think you need, really need it. If you have good fascia, you don't need it. That's a very good um, vascularized base for skin grafting directly. So I think in the forearm, sure. you could use that. Um, but there's some thought um, that it does create an extra layer to allow that skin pliability. So I'm not saying it needs to be used for that, but if it's an area sure. where you really want it over like a joint uh, where you want, you know, even though you may have a great base, it may give you that extra layer to allow a little bit of, of motion of that skin. So that may be some, that may be part of the conversation uh, you could have with the patient. But I think, um, you know, there is also the, like you said, the description of the, of the sandwiching technique where you go back and you, you layer it once or twice over if you don't get what you need just to create that base. Um, so sure. if you didn't get the first time, you can do that. I think that if, if, um, if there's exposed tendon, and even if there's no peritinon, they 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 do fine. This is actually even works better. That's even more of an indication for it. But if you have peritinon, you could forego it. But I think a lot of it will be based upon um, how you know how clean the wound is. So if my wound sure. is fairly fairly clean, you could probably go directly to this graft. But I think the nice thing about the matrix, it does buy you a little bit of time to get the granulation there, and also to really assess the wound to really see if if there's you know, if there's an infection that's going to take place and now we don't burn sure. your skin graft. Yeah, that's a good point. All right, Dr. Benhammer is going to take us to the next uh, step, which is his cases. Sorry for the disappearance. A little internet issue. So I'm um, going to talk around two cases. And the first one is uh, another electrical burn. This is a 22-year-old who had an electrical burn to his <clears throat> thumb uh, 10 days ago. And he's been referred after debridement, which included his FPL and his nerves and arteries. And he's been then allografted and uh, referred. And the allograft didn't stick. Um, uh, and so you see some areas of exposed bone um, without any um, anything to graft on. So Does he he's, have otherwise, he's otherwise a healthy person. So any thoughts, Jay? Well, I'm thinking of uh, really this, like the sensibility. Like, does he are the digital nerves uh, intact or they're or unknown, or maybe they are intact? No, digital nerves are gone, completely gone. Yeah. Um, it's hard to assess, because uh, it's an electrical burn, whether he's got some um, sensation that might come in from his dorsal sensory branch of his radial nerve, because sometimes they'll creep in on either sides of uh, the nail on the thumb, um, because he's, he's pretty numb in his thumb, period. Um, but yeah, his digital nerves are gone at that level. That's a major decision point for me is like, how are we going to restore sensibility? Uh, because whatever reconstruction you do, if you don't have sensibility, the function is going to be so uh, impeded. The other idea is, is trying to get uh, fairly uh, efficient coverage as far as timing, because it, you know this looks like a wound that's a little bit desiccated. I'm worried about the, uh, losing the FPL, losing what you have, losing the FPL or getting some type of in infection uh, in this wound. Um, so, uh, so there, there is no FPL, so you don't have to worry. Oh, about there's that. not an FPL. Okay. So, so there you go. So that's another part of the reconstruction is that he need, unless you're considering maybe uh, doing a primary fusion, uh, like lessening the complexity of your reconstruction by just accepting that you're going to fuse the IP joint. But I would, I would try if you could to reconstruct the FPL, uh, with, uh, with your reconstructive plan, I would try to. If you felt like you couldn't do that, then that's a bailout is that you would include some type of fusion of the IP joint, although maybe you would consider staging that. Like that doesn't have to be the first stage as you get the coverage done, you get 
sensibility done and then go and then uh, knowing that you don't have a flexor you can go back and fuse it at a later date when everything else is healed i don't know dr jane what do you what are your thoughts no i agree with that and i, I like the idea of, of quick coverage for this because i've seen some of these patients you know develop osteomyelitis of the bone with the exposure or even even in, you know having in uh, a joint issue as well so i, I think you know, the main thing is to, to get this covered and, you know, I think uh, really gain that sensation back. And I guess the question is how, how much of a defect uh, the digital nerves are on both the ulnar and radial side. So the, the big problem with the, the digital nerve defect is it goes all the way into the pulp. It yeah. goes halfway into the pulp. So Which I don't know. I, technically, I don't know how I would be able to have a distal target it's kind of like arborized at that point so i don't know if there's really a technical target that i could that i would be able to plug into maybe uh, considering uh staging that you know like could you go back and add that as a later the sensation maybe some type of reconstruction like a littler flap where you take uh you know uh, a neurotized flap from another area as a second stage i don't know but but the primary reconstruction i think would be technically very difficult to for me because i don't know what my targets would be so any, but I, any other thoughts well I, I would say the the first step is to get it covered and then whatever these other things you need to do maybe consider that as a second stage because i'm 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 thinking you're going to lose this thumb if we don't get it covered so in a in an in a situation where maybe a non-complicated choice could be a groin flap like you could get this reconstructed with a groin flap um, I'm thinking of uh, a metacarpal artery flap. Uh, metacarpal artery flaps can be harvested with nerve uh, uh, segments in order to, but I, I don't think that would be sufficient necessarily. Um, but uh, I would try to do something that's uh, something you could do now. I would, I would try to avoid maybe the dermal substitutes for this just because it's going to be another four weeks. And then if it doesn't work, if we're not a, you know, two weeks down the line before we know if it's working. So I would try to get maybe a groin flap or um, you could do, um, you know, maybe a, a, like you could do like a lateral arm flap or some type of free flap that, uh, for that. I know that tonight we're talking about like local reconstructions. Yeah, I, I like those options. I think that um, if possible, I think I like the FDMA just because it does give you some sensation where he doesn't have any there, even though it's not at the pulp, it does give a little bit sort of right, just proximal to that potentially. So sure. it's got, it could be sort of a, you know, it's not the best, but it's something. That's a good point. So, yeah. So uh, I think those are all great options. And the other thing um, I spoke to him about um, in terms of options was doing a toe pulp reconstruction and just excising his existing pulp and uh, resurfacing it all, but he didn't want um, any other part of his body really touched. He wasn't uh, willing to sacrifice his toe and all of this. So, um, and uh, so you mentioned an FDMA flap, which is a you know a great option. Um, and its blood supply was described back in the late '80s, but the flap had been around before that, um, described as a, a type of flag flap or kite flap. Um, and it's got this first dorsal metacarpal artery. And I'm just going to show you another uh, case just by way of example, because I think talking about an FDMA is, is, is worthy in this particular case. And this one is a skill saw injury where somebody's gone down and taken out part of their collateral ligament and it's down on the bone and they have the soft tissue defect. And you could um, maybe dermal substitute this or something. Uh, something else, but in this particular case, uh, used a uh, first dorsal metacarpal artery flap. And so when you raise that flap, you're going to raise it off the index metacarpal. And I like to take a triangle or teardrop of the, off the flap over the sagittal uh, fibers because that's where the vessel gets really thin. So you protect the vessel and then you elevate skin skin flaps, which are really thin. So you can take a cuff of fat and fascia uh, all the way down to your vessel and you have to watch out in case in the 10% where the vessel's in the muscle. Um, and then you lift that all the way back to its takeoff off the radial artery where the artery divides between the two metacarpals. And 
on the right side, you can see the flaps sewn in place um, in this particular case. And you can start the patient on early motion and it has a reasonable result and quick healing to get this worker back to his lifestyle. So um, key points, again, template de defect, triangulate it or teardrop it over the sagittal fibers. Um, the skin over the proximal phalanx you have to preserve because you want to keep the peritene on. You raise skin flap to either side to expose the subcutaneous tissue. And then you take a cuff all the way down uh, to the radial artery where it comes off. So you're not dissecting the vessel. You're really taking a cuff of tissue to make this flap work. So um, the problem in this particular case is he already has impaired sensation to the tip of his thumb. And when he goes to reach over and pinch, he's going to reach over and pinch on his index finger. And when you take an FDMA flap, you're potentially going to denervate over sort of the radial aspect of the middle phalanx, uh, depending upon the innervation of his uh, index finger. Um, and so um, it's probably not good for key pinch or side pinch that you've denervated by doing the flap. So if you go back to the article or other articles, you know that there's a second dorsal metacarpal artery flap. So you can also raise the second dorsal metacarpal artery flap in this uh, particular sen sensation situation and the innervator. And so that's what we did in, for this case. And here's the template of the defect. You can see I've marked it out with a blue marker, stuck, stuck some telfa on it and lift it back up, move the defect over so it's marked out. And here's the uh, nerve going into the flap. And here's the vessel going into the flap. <clears throat> and in this, in, for this, the nerve is always over top of the extensor tendons and the vessels underneath. So if you want to move it over, <clears throat> you have to, and redo, like you're going to have to redo your anastomosis unless you do another trick, which I'll talk about in a second. So we divided the nerve and slowed the nerve into the digital nerves. We dissected back, tried to get into what we thought was healthy nerve to get away from the electrical burn, make sure we have enough nerve to do that, and moved it over. And this just shows you, again, the, the pedicle is a cuff, and you take the fascia between the two metacarpals to raise the flap, and this is the nerve. And then we tunneled it over, and uh, this is a follow-up result, and you can see that his donor site looks pretty good. It's pretty reasonable. It's a patch-like scar with a full thickness skin graft on it. The contour to the thumb is pretty reasonable. It's not bulky. He's got space in there, um, and he got a re into his flap. He didn't get normal, but he was satisfied. And he was didn't want anything else done with his hand. He was happy. So um, That's a great case. So th there is another way to, uh, to deal with the nerves. And I'm just going to quickly show you this is another thumb defect. This is a crush injury. Um, um, there's probably other ways. But again, this is a second uh, dorsal metacarpal artery. And instead of sewing it into the digital nerves in this case, what we did was divide the extensor tendon. So then you can bring the nerve across with the flap. And just did a solid nerve repair, a so solid tendon repair, a four strand tendon repair, and then rehabbed it with a, a relative motion splint so he didn't get stiff. And then he got, of course, you didn't have to divide the nerve. So you're not cutting axons. And every time you cut axons, you lose axons. And he, he was happy with his result. He didn't want to do anything else. Um, and he had, a protective sensation in the end of his stump. So, um, and since we're talking about uh, this vascular territory, it can also be flipped in reverse. And this just is an example of flipping this same flap in reverse to cover up a gunshot wound injury. And um, again, same vascular territory, second dorsal metacarpal, uh, leave the perforators that are coming uh, from the Palmer side, flip your flap over and close up everything. So it works both ways. So second dorsal metacarpal artery, template your defect, teardrop it, make sure you got the sagittal fibers covered, 
consider using it for innervation when you want to maintain innervation to the thumb when the thumb sensation is impaired. You can divide and repair the extensor tendon to maintain the nerve and rehab with a relative motion splint. Again, don't dissect the pedicle, take it um, with a cuff. And if you want to review the article, this is a, a good review article. So that's the uh, first case. So um, now I want to talk about another case. <clears throat> Can I make a comment just before we go to the next case? This, sure. uh, for me, learning, I, I never saw a first dorsal metacarpal or second dorsal metacarpal artery flap in residency. I was exposed to that, seeing that, being, you know, assisting as a fellow. But, uh, you know, maybe one of our participants uh, has that type of experience. I've seen this. I, I know that it's useful. For me, like, I really came more comfortable after going to one of our in-person courses. And I would just say to any of the participants, if you want to go from a, a setting where you, you know about something, but you want to, like, start incorporating it into your practice, come to one of our in-person courses. Sit with Dr. Ben Hammer and he'll show you how he does it. Like you're with him, with the cadaver, doing it together. After having done that, the fellows course, as well as the advanced course years ago, I find this to be so useful. So many times patients will come in with a thumb injury and the residents are thinking, well, we can't fix this. We're going to shorten the thumb. And I'll say, no, wait a minute. Let's try and see if we can maintain link with a, with a flap. Um, so anyways, just a little plug out to our in-person courses. Yeah, I, I agree. To work with a cadaver form that's got latex in it really helps you understand the vascular network and where to find the vessels. Yeah, it makes a big difference. Sure. So this uh, a 20 year old who sustained a punch press injury two weeks ago, and there was a, an initial attempt at salvage, um, but his soft tissues um, necrosed. And he's undergone um, amputation of the thumb and index. And um, he has a stump of metacarpal left, which you can just see here. Um, he, his wound is now clean. He's had a couple of uh, INDs, and it's really ready for closure or coverage. You know, in my mind, what I start to think about is like local and regional vessels that I could use to perfuse a flap. And so I think of the arch in this, uh, or the arches, the deep arch, the superficial arch, and like, would they be damaged and would they be a part of the zone of injury? Could you do a reverse radial forearm flap for this? I worry with this injury and the mechanism and this, that how the arches are, are so close to where this was injured. I'd be thinking if, if I even considered it, I should get an angiogram to, 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 uh, to check. Uh, that's kind of my first thought is, is what would I use? I mean, certainly a groin flap, you could get a groin flap to cover this. That's, that's certainly a, uh, it's interesting. I've worked with, with residents who've never seen a groin flap. And when we discuss it, they're like, Oh, we could use these other things. I'd say, but don't you want to learn the groin flap? I mean, it's, it's good to have that as a bailout. I've had patients who have had sepsis and their their arch is completely destroyed by the sepsis and we're using a groin flap to reconstruct portions of their uh, hand. So, yeah, what would my, you say, my, Dr. Jane? Yeah, my thoughts exactly. So you're you're really taking the words out of my mouth here. So I think that uh, I I would love to use a reverse radial on here. However, I am worried about that arch. And I think this would be actually a great case for a groin flap because you really get that you know, it, it's it's a large flap. It covers the defect effectively. You'd get good soft tissue coverage. Um, and I think this would be easy to maintain um, positioning for the patient because you're not really trying to get into an, an intricate area of the hand. Um, it really should, you know, uh, fit nicely. But I, I would still... I would still do an Allen's test and then I would sub follow up with an angio of this just to make sure, because, you know, obviously it's, it's much easier to tolerate from a patient perspective, to have a reverse radial than it is to, you know, have a groin flap. Yeah. So, um, the, the radial artery was clearly damaged. I can't remember whether we actually clipped it off, but, um, we were like debriding necrotic tissue all through, um, the space. Um, we sure. both between the two metacarpals. Um, yeah, so groin flap's a great, uh, great idea for um, 
soft tissue coverage in this situation allows you lots of options and you haven't burned any bridges. Um, so um, your other option would be uh, a PIA flap. And I realize it might not be the first thing that might come to people's mind um, when they see this uh, defect. And as you may recall from reading is that it's between the ECU and the EDM and EDC up here. And it's that uh, posterior interosseous artery traveling down and then it can anastomose with the anterior interosseous artery, the dorsal carpal vessels, and sometimes even uh, around the ulnar head. And sometimes it's hard to figure out uh, how to uh, where this flap actually sits, despite there being landmarks uh, at the distal ulna and your epicondyle. And uh, this little paper um, uh, has some good illustrations, and I, I was, that's why I put put this picture on here um, because it's actually from the article. And that is um, the way you start this. Besides lining everything up and drawing out your template, etc., is you start down here and you uh, incise the skin to find your ECU and your EDM. And what that really allows you to do is to find the interval because the vessels between the two of them. And so if you haven't got your flap oriented exactly where you want it to, you can adjust as you go, um, as you follow up the EDM. It's easy to pick off the ECU or see the ECU because it's such a big fat tendon down here. Uh, the EDM is a little, you might have to look for it a little bit to see it, but the ECU is very easy. And you can see where they put their markings for their flap, that they, they changed the flap. Uh, as they were um, proceeding proximally and elevating the flap because they realized um, that they were off a little bit. And that's okay um, uh, because that's the way, uh, a good way to approach this. You can also open this up at the time and make sure that the vessels are there. Um, and some of the literature says that about 5% of the time, um, the uh, vessels aren't there. Fortunately, I'm not... Uh, I haven't run into that encounter yet or uh, absence of vessels, but uh, it allows you to check if you want. And then the way to do this is follow up. Uh, personally, I like to follow up the EDM because that allows me to open up this interval. And the other thing it allows you to do, um, and the hand in this patient is to the left, is, uh, and frequently, uh, maybe it's only you and maybe a nurse, uh, maybe even you by yourself. But when you um, just open up the fascia over the EDM, uh, your flat falls back away from you, and it just opens up the interval uh, so that you can see then the uh, as you release all that fascia. And here I've sewn the fascia up to the flap. Uh, and then you can see the perforators, and you can also uh, see the posterior interosseous nerve continuation. This is just a close-up of what you just saw. And so, um, again, you'll see this branch as you get up here approximately that goes to the ECU that you want to preserve. You'll see a branch that comes down all the way down to your EPL uh, and also your extensor indices, um, your extensor digiti minimi, um, so you can protect and preserve those. And you'll see your perforators coming up into your flap. Occasionally, um, this flap is a little bit of a challenge because there can be some fascial bands running across and you have to take your time. It's not, at least I find it's a little trickier than doing a reverse radial form, which you can just zip through. Um, so it's a little bit trickier. So this is the same patient and um, this is the flap sewn in place. And you notice... Um, that in fact, I've exteriorized the pedicle. And so this is a trick that sometimes is useful. So in this particular case, you know, it's a little bit larger defect and you need to get it over a little bit more than you might uh, anticipate. And if you exteriorize the pedicle, then it just allows you to position it a little better, not have to worry about tension or kinking. Um, and you just put some uh, double layer of like gelinet or Vaseline impregnated gauze over this, uh, along with the rest of your dressing. And this part uh, down here, we uh, skin grafted. 
Um, and uh, you can also skin graft over the fat here or, and the pedicle if you want. You can skin graft it all or you can just dress it. Um, another little trick to try and close your donor site a little bit more is you can use some gelinate uh, tie over uh, bolsters with like a 3 nylon. And you can put that nylon right over top of the muscle and then you can stick your skin graft on top of that. And then you just pull your stitches out it doesn't matter that the nylon is between the skin graft and the muscle at all. It, it just works. So nice. uh, this is him at uh, just when we're going to divide the pedicle and you can do this under local. That's what we did was we did it under local anesthesia and divided his pedicle. And you can see this, this other part that we just skin grafted is fine. And this all healed in. And unfortunately, as you can imagine, for a 20-year-old, this was um, rather difficult, to say the least, uh, to experience this. And I don't have a, a subsequent photo. He didn't want um, any more pictures taken. So I respected that and said, fine. So I don't have a photo of what it looks like after insetting, but this is another case. PIA works great for tight web spaces. This is a crush injury. <laughs> with a very scarred in first web space. And when you release this, you have a big through and through hole that you need not only skin on the outside, but you got to fill that hole. And so it works well. And you can do the same thing if you want. You can exteriorize it. And then you can divide the pedicle again under local and it sits right down flat eventually and looks uh, like a pretty reasonable result. So um, posterior interosseous artery flap, key points, it's retrograde flow through um, the posterior interosseous artery, which can connect with the anterior interosseous, the dorsal carpal arches, and the ulnar head. The axis is from the ulnar head to the lateral epicondyle with a pivot point of about two centimeters um, proximal to the head. Sometimes you can take it even further, depending upon how good the vessels are. Um, you want to avoid the proximal uh, quarter of the form. Um, I have gone up that high, but uh, I think you're, you start to play a bit of a gamble there. It's the septum, as I mentioned, between the ECU and EDM, which can be easily identified. Uh, you can adjust it as required. You can identify the distal connections. Harvest the relevant perforators, and you stay away from the pin to the ECU. Um, usually retrograde for the hand, but it can also be integrate for the elbow. And you can, if you need to, exteriorize the pedicle for compression, positioning, or length. And those are my two cases. Well, that's uh, that's uh, just about perfect on the timing. So uh, Keely's going to uh, go ahead and uh, kind of get her slides up. But just as any, uh, some questions that had come up. Um, one question that is regarding uh, groin flaps. Uh, is it, can you divide the groin flap at the second stage uh, sooner than three weeks? So, so, for example, they said, could it be done safely at two weeks? Uh, what are the indications to delay division of the flap to prevent flap congestion necrosis? And is timing dependent on comorbidities like diabetes? Dr. Jane, what are, you, what are your thoughts on the groin flap division? Yeah, I think you could potentially do it a little bit earlier. I probably wouldn't go I'm probably a little bit hesitant going at two weeks, but maybe two and a half. But I, you could also check it out by 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 sequentially tightening your 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 pedicle and see if it survives. So you you can always throw sutures through your uh, or, or wrap around the, the actual base and just tighten it and see if it if it if it does well. And you can also do that selectively if you want to uh, open up some some choke vessels by you know uh, actually suturing part of your pedicle off a little bit, and you can sort of you know increase blood flow there to sort of force the the recipient uh, to you know. Um, increase the blood flow into the flap. So I think those are little techniques you could do to sort of force it um, as, as a pedicle flap. Very good. All right, Keely. Okay. Gonna bring us home. Yes. So um, touching on a little bit about upper extremity flaps and some considerations when um, we're seeing these patients post-op or delivery. I think um, kind of this first slide is just some points that I always like to think about and consider. And I think for me, when I'm working with clients, um, kind of with a range of injuries, is how quickly can we get them to return a function? So the first kind of case here that I have is a 80-year-old female who is involved in a motorcycle accident. So 
we started working with her while she was an inpatient. Um, so they had done like an initial IND. We made her a resting splint. Um, but going back to check the splint with, you know, before she had gotten the Integra placed, she started to have a little bit of color change in her hands. Um, so we're kind of keeping an eye on that with the dressing change. Um, I have some kind of sequential pictures with her after she had gotten the Integra off. She was skin grafted. And at that point with working with her, we um, transitioned from a resting orthotic to more of a volar based MP block and starting that glide right away. Just with her age and um, kind of the frailty of her tissues, we really with the surgeon wanted to start kind of a guided therapy motion and get gu gliding of those tendons in kind of as quickly as possible. Um, she had some um, kind of necrosis of the skin grafting. So working in therapy, we kind of worked on dressing changes, doing some little bit of debridement of that off. Um, eventually she had a little bit of hypergranulation that we noted. And so then we, you know, contacted the surgical team and they were able to come um, and do a little bit of silver nitrate with that too. So, um, but I think the biggest thing too, I mean, when we're getting patients thinking about the mechanism of injury, you know, trauma versus maybe a tumor resection, the involved structures. I mean, she had, um, obviously you can see with her um, fourth metacarpal, some kind of bone exposure, um, some ligament instability there too. So just being mindful of that kind of through the whole, whole rehab process. Um, touching a little bit more on wound care, you know, often we see folks back and, you know, we're starting movement and motion in conjunction with also doing some dressing changes and some soft tissue work. Um, really being mindful of the, the type of dressing that we're using, I think is important. So we don't want anything to stick or adhere to the skin graft itself or the flap. Um, you know, using a material like a Vanna cream or Aquaphor and, you know, thinking about the patient considerations too, you know, we don't want to make things too complex for them. So whether they're coming to us with assistance for dressing changes, do they have access to the materials they need for dressing changes? Um, this particular individual was an 18-year-old male, um, a gunshot wound to the forearm, a hunting accident. In the bottom kind of right-hand picture, you can see he had an area of kind of some fibrinous slop. And actually, while he was working in therapy, we were doing some manual therapy at his elbow we pushed some purulence out. So call the surgeon right away, sent them back to therapy, got a drain placed. And actually, there'll be more on him in a bit when we talk about some scar management too. Um, orthotic fabrication is another topic that we touch on, really making sure that we're avoiding any shearing forces, especially early on, to both the flaps and the donor sites. Um, really being mindful of avoiding pressure, especially across the pedicle, making sure that the perfusion is well maintained throughout the whole process. So I don't, I didn't have great, great pictures of different orthotics, but I have some examples of how we often pre-pad individuals, either with towels, washcloths, or some pre-padding as well. Um, we're going to kind of buzz through some of these just with our time. Um, some range of motion considerations, again, trying to get range of motion back as quickly as possible. With digital flaps, as a therapist, I'm really worried about PIP contractures, so this can be such a headache. Um, so thinking about if we can position like intrinsic plus, you know, making sure that we're um, keeping unaffected joints moving. Um, dorsal hand flaps, really thinking about kind of getting aggressive with MP motion as soon as we can to keep those extensor tendons gliding. Um, and then moving up to like the elbow. So being mindful once that flap can tolerate stress and motion, monitoring it. Um, and then kind of, again, monitoring the uninvolved joints as well. Scar management is another topic. So this individual on the right, this is actually the young man that we push some purulence out in therapy and kind of, you know, this is the, the final end. So really good result with his motion, but I, um, I want to kind of point your attention to his soft tissue. You know, he was very diligent. We used a variety of taping methods, like an elastic kinesio tape. We also used some paper tape. He was very diligent, you know, putting kind of alternating between the two and then also using silicone to introduce some moisture um, and to help 
kind of with the soft tissue flattening. Um, the picture that I have on the left is something to be mindful of. So this is a patient who had a tumor resection kind of across the dorsum of his hand and wrist, but he was also undergoing some radiation in conjunction with this. So just his tissue healing, you know, so he came and just because he had those sutures out doesn't mean that he's ready for any sort of aggressive scar management. Um, then also edema control, being mindful of that. This is a, a way that we can get kind of creative, especially when we're dealing with kind of a change in the anatomy of the hand or with amputation. So using like an elastomer mold, so we custom fit this to this gentleman's finger. Um, he had a gunshot wound to his long finger. And so the surgeon took kind of what was remaining of the skin and transferred it over to kind of the ulnar aspect of his index finger. Um, he had some swelling there that also kind of extended down through his palm. So we, I fabricated an elastomer mold for him and then we secured it with some coband. So he would use that at nighttime just to make sure that we're getting a little bit of compression there to try to optimize the motion at his index finger and P joint as much as we can because along the bowler aspect, he was getting a little bit of a, um, a delay in motion with, with his swelling. And then again, kind of going back to function and the sensibility. So this is another example. We started working with this patient. Um, he's a 60 year old farmer. Um, he had got his hand stuck in a corn picker. And so we were working with him inpatient doing his wound cares because of the exposed bone and tendon. Um, he went on to you know several stages of INDs, debridement, skin grafting, and he had a groin flap. Um, we started early on with him with some graded motor imagery and some mirror box because he was having pretty significant phantom limb pain early on. Um, and then once they were able to achieve the soft tissue coverage and closure, we did a lot of scar massage and desensitization training. So starting with different textures um, and working them up to different tolerance because kind of his end goal was to be able to be fitted with a prosthetic. So with this gentleman, it was really great to see, you know, I worked with him as an inpatient and just recently got to see him with his prosthetic. So working through the sensitivity, maybe some of that hypersensitivity through um, his residual limb and then working to be able to train him with the prosthetic so he could get back to, to doing those functional, functional things. So, um, I have a slide for questions here. I don't know, Jay, if you wanted to pull your slide up. Yeah. So we have, we do have some questions. Um, let me just, uh, you can go ahead and uh, stop sharing. And, uh, uh, the questions that we have, and I'll bring up my slide here in a second, but, um, Question on weaving taping. What is that uh, for regarding scar management? Yeah, Can you so give us I some like, idea? Yeah, yep. Um, so I like to use, so the, the concept of having the tape and with the weave and the different textures on the tape and the scar is, is to provide some traction to the scar um, to try to kind of lift the most superficial layers of skin and epidermis to try to free some of that from the tendons and the underlying structures that need to move. Um, so we do instruct patients on scar massage and just manually doing that. If patients' skin can tolerate taping, I do like to do it because then as they're just doing their exercises, as they're moving, as they're doing function, they're getting some traction, they're getting some pull on that scar to try to help it lay a little bit flatter and um, to try to free that from any adhesions in the underlying structures that may limit motion. The second question is, uh, maybe more of a technical issue or question of uh, the elastomer, the mold. Uh, my understanding is that, uh, and you, you please elaborate the, the, the temperature type of uh, molding that you're using with a water bath is my understanding. Yeah. So actually with the elastomer, it's, it's a base and a compound um, and we mix the two together. So it's both of them are kind of like a, a silly putty or a Play-Doh texture. And then when we mix it together, it activates and it kind of hardens to a rubber material that I, I kind of think of it almost like a bouncy ball. Um, so mm -hmm. it helps introduce some moisture into the tissues, but then we can also use that to put pressure and really customize the shape um, to get some limb shaping. If there's um, any bit of like pocket of fluid or kind of a little bit of a bulbous area in the soft tissue, we can sometimes correct some of that. When you see patients over time as their edema is uh, changing, then you just make a new mold. Is that is that yep. the next step? Yes. Yep. Typically, um, like with that gentleman, um, I actually made that with 
him just a week ago. So I would expect in two to three weeks that we would remake another one kind of as his swelling goes down. Mm -hmm. That's one of the questions is how long would the molding process, I I guess that you'd base it on the amount of edema they have, but generally what would you say? Is it like several months that you're doing molding or? Um, I would say probably like three weeks to a month kind of remolding. Again, it's kind of the acuity of where the edema is and how quickly it reduces. But again, you want like a nice, and let's again, we can get a nice custom fit over that area. And as soon as that changes and it's not fitting well, then it's it's kind of time to to remold it. And uh, I know that we don't talk a lot about specific products, but just like the tape that you were weaving, is that something that's found for mo- like most therapists would be able to find that or? Yeah, uh, um, I think so. I actually saw it once in Home Depot when I was walking through. So it's um, kind of an elastic tape. Um, there's different brands, Kinesio tape, Rock tape. Um, you know, CrossFit gyms have it. I mean, it Target, I think, sells it. You can kind of find it over the counter. And sometimes I'll even tell patients, you know, Google or look patients sure. the car. Because really, um, you know, I think sometimes if it is a little bit different each time, patients still have a good result. It doesn't have to be exactly the same each time it's done. Very good. Well, uh we're really coming to an end and I'll just kind of summarize our take home points. And then if there's any additional uh, questions from the faculty, we can discuss those as well. But the whole goal tonight is to think about like decision choices and making a, a preoperative plan. One of the technical, uh, you know, making your steps in your technical plan. One of the the cases, Dr. Ben Hammer, they showed the uh, PIA flap where they, in that article, they did their distal dissection first, marked out where they thought they would be harvesting their skin paddle, but based on their dissection had to change, you know, kind of being prepared for that. Had they been sized proximally first and dissected distally, they wouldn't even be over their perforators necessarily. So um, those are the, those are those technical pearls, you know, it's, it's uh, thinking about each step in your, your, uh, your technical plan. Um, the assessment, like coming up with a needs-based assessment, what's the goal, what's the, what are the functional uh, goals of your reconstruction? Um, and then, you know, the Dr. Uh, Jane went over, you know, complications, being prepared for complications, uh, and also having the hybrid uh, model. I think that's great. And I think that, you know, as more and more of these products come on the market, it allows us to expand things that we were more difficult to treat in the past. Um, but the whole idea is to try to lessen, uh, morbidity, decreased complications and try to get people back, uh, to a satisfactory result and something that Keely can work with that the therapist can work with right away. Uh, I think is the goal. Uh, we have a couple more questions here. Let me just pull up our question and answer, uh, things. I think we've covered everything. I think the one, the last one was similar to the tape. Like how would you go about getting more elastomeric material or molding material? I think that that's something that, that therapists can can find through different avenues. Keely, can you mention some yes, typical yeah, ones? Yeah, I think, um, you know, therapists could probably find it through like any medical supply company. Um, you know, sometimes uh, if elastomer isn't available, sometimes like silicone gel sheeting can also be a similar product that can be used. And that may be a little bit easier to find at, at a drugstore. Um, but I think the elastomer would probably be more of a specialty product um, through like a medical supply company. Because it does, the two compounds have to be mixed. Very good. Well, I, we're going to finish with that uh, tonight. I just want to uh, remind the audience, please join us again in May for our next soft tissue uh, webinar, which will be specifically about uh, free flaps. And it'll be very similar, developing a treatment plan, technical plan, complications, addressing complications. I get a lot of questions from junior uh, faculty and colleagues about, you know, taking a flat back in the middle of the night, decision-making for that, protocols that we use. All of those are things, technical pearls that we're going to talk about and similarly for treatment planning, but in the context of free tissue transfers in May. So thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Thank you for the faculty for uh, helping. And with that, I'll say good night. Recording stopped. Thank you all. Appreciate yeah. your Thank help. You. Thanks. Thank you guys did a great job. Have a good yeah, even with night. the internet issue, we got you back on. <laughs> <laughs>
Great recovery. Great yeah, save. That was, really yeah. that was great. <laughs> Thank you so new. I just threw you in there like, okay, we're going on. Yeah, yeah no, so no problem. <laughs> it was great. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you all. Have a great night. Yes, you too. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye everyone.